we can balance this. Um, thank you very much indeed for a, a overly generous welcome. Uh, thank you very much to the, uh, the Foundation of Wiener Ansbach for organizing and uh, funding all its activities, including the, the Walter uh, Gensel van der Meesch, uh, chair, which I am thrilled and honored to be, um, to be occupying uh, th this week here at, at ULB. So, th so thank you very much for, for the invitation. Um, I guess when I wrote the book Brexit Time, Leaving the EU, Why, How and When, I didn't think the difficult question was going to be when. I thought that was thought that law had, had laid that down, but things are getting a little more complicated on that as of today. But issues of time are, 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 are things that preoccupy me a little bit at the moment. Uh, and one of those is to think that actually I first came to Brussels uh, back in 1992 uh, when I was working on a project on uh, completing the, the European single market. Um, and this was quite an exciting time to, uh, to be working on, on European issues. Uh, the UK's Economic and Social Research Council, another great funder of research, um, was funding projects on the European single market, uh, and which was giving a kind of real boost to academic interest in the UK in economic and political integration in Europe. The ambition to create a truly European single market was also appeared to be a basis for, for building a consensus uh, around European community membership back in the UK uh, and seemed to cut across both the, the left and right of, of politics at the time. So membership of the European community and the, the single market seemed to be tied together in a kind of form of, of left-right consensus. I could hardly have imagined that I would then more than a quarter of a century later be back in Brussels, um, reflecting on what the UK's departure from the European Union might tell us about the nature of European governance. And I certainly didn't imagine that the UK's Economic and Social Research Council would be funding a very large stream of research on what the UK's withdrawal from the European Union uh, is going to, going to mean. So for the purposes of this evening's lecture, I want to explore what it means to be governed by Europe and to govern through Europe. And the title reflects a kind of conventional constitutional idea, namely, namely that through the act of democratic self-governance, through a set of institutions and structures, we also consent to be, got, to be bound by that system of government and what it produces. The issue that I'll explore is how that sort of legal and constitutional discipline manifests itself in the context of the EU's style or styles of governance. But more particularly, I want to see if in thinking about the styles of governance, we can learn any lessons either from Brexit or for Brexit. My aim this evening is to reflect on how EU governance has evolved since 1992. And I will structure my remarks around three themes. These are the relationship between supranationalism versus intergovernmentalism in EU governance. The relationship between depoliticized versus democratically accountable governance. And finally, the reach and influence of the European Union beyond its borders. To begin, I will map out a perhaps familiar terrain, namely the connection between the characterization of European governance in terms of supranationalism and intergovernmentalism. And this was, in fact, the kind of big theoretical debate in the early 1990s when I first started working on, on European issues back in 1992. For present purposes, I will put supranationalism on the side of governed by Europe and intergovernmentalism on the side of governing through Europe. So the first question we will need to address is whether the, the lesson of Brexit is that the forces of supranationalism have triumphed and with the effect that we all now feel governed by Europe in ways that we 
either didn't anticipate or simply don't want. My conclusion will be that this is a fairly poor description of contemporary European governance and a simplistic understanding of the causes of Brexit. The second part of the lecture reinterprets the dichotomy posed in the question posed in the title by asking what it means to be governed by bodies independent of the domestic political process, rather than governing through democratic institutions, either domestically or at a European level. The rise of the independent agency, whether a central bank or a regulator, is of course far from being a singularly European phenomenon. Nonetheless, the European Union as a whole is sometimes viewed as the external manifestation of the regulatory state. While the response to the financial and economic crisis in Europe is one that often seems to accelerate or dramatize attempts to depoliticize decision making, both domestically and at a European level. So the effect may be a reaction in the form of a repoliticization of domestic politics against technocracy. So our second question is this. Have we given up on the hope of collective democratic self-governance through European institutions in favour of a system of government in Europe that is hollowing out democratic politics within and across the nation states? My conclusion is that the lesson we learn from Brexit, however, is not that it will uh, afford an opportunity to scale back the regulatory state, but rather it will continue to reproduce the, regu the regulatory state, but in a, in a domestic uh, setting. The final part of the lecture addresses the central issue of whether the question posed in the title presents a simply a false dichotomy. In other words, is the choice really between being governed by Europe or governing through Europe, or is the lesson that we should just not be governed by Europe at all, or have nothing to do with Europe at all? We simply go it alone. Now, for any state deciding that it wants to relinquish the discipline of its EU membership, the fundamental concern is what sort of balance can be struck between going it alone and continuing to be governed by and through European institutions. And Brexit is, shredding, is shedding light on the range of potential structures and models of cooperation that might be forged in the wider European governance landscape beyond the discipline of European membership itself. Therefore, the third and final question to be addressed is really the fundamental question of Brexit. Is it actually possible to govern beyond the reach of influence of the European Union? My conclusion here is that any version of Brexit involves being governed by Europe in some sense. And therefore the issue is whether the UK can, has any mechanism and means of seeking to exert its voice either through Europe or internationally. Now, my intention this evening is not to spread the ills and ailments of British politics to the rest of Europe. Brexit is a very peculiar, peculiar British phenomenon in many respects. And I've described it elsewhere as what happens when an over-constitutionalized European Union meets an under-constitutionalized United Kingdom. But equally, I don't think that we as Europeans can simply quarantine the Brexit pathogen on a small island to the north and west of the continent of Europe. Brexit is opening the lid on wider phenomena to which we all need to pay attention if the European integration project is going to sustain itself. So let's begin with the first of my themes. Is supranationalism being governed by Europe on the rise and is it to blame for Brexit? 
Now, when I started the project in the single market back in 1992, the main theoretical debate seemed to be around how best to characterise uh, European integration. On the one hand, some saw the single market programme and its revival of the role of the European Commission as a rule initiator, as evidence of a reinvigorated supranationalism. After a period of stagnation, the forces of functionalism and interdependence appeared to be intensifying the role and relevance of supranational institutions. With policy linkage between the internal market, social, environmental, competition policies, also providing evidence of a transfer of governance activities from the nation state to supranational institutions. So with a re revitalized European Commission under President Jacques Delors, and a European Parliament growing in influence and a European Court of Justice maintaining uh, and expanding its authority, a new supranational institutional balance appeared to be emerging, if you like, a modern money method. On the other hand, this characterization was under attack. 1993 saw the publication of Andy Moravichik's uh, Provocative Preferences in Power article in the Journal of Common Market Studies where he set out a sophisticated liberal intergovernmentalist account of European integration. The thesis was essentially that through intergovernmental bargains, member states delegated functional tasks to European institutions in areas where there was a demand for intergovernmental cooperation. The pace and extent of integration was dictated not by supranational institutions, but by national governments under the constraints of domestic politics and national interests. Now these different characterizations, supranationalist and intergovernmentalist, were seeking to make sense of effectively the same phenomenon, that is the single market program and the, the, the renaissance of European integration. However, the debate would also be fueled by changes in the way in which the European Union governed from 1992 onwards. And there is no doubt that the 1992 programme had pushed EU rulemaking and governance by law and hierarchy to the fore. And there seemed to be a consensus that EU level harmonisation was the right way to achieve a truly European single market. But 1992 was also a watershed in terms of the problems faced in agreeing the Maastricht Treaty and its subsequent ratification. In the UK, a fragile Conservative government almost lost its parliamentary fight to get approval of the deal. Not much has really changed then since 1992. Concerns about the transfers of powers to the EU also leave behind Danish voters' reluctance to agree the new treaty. And the language of subsidiarity entered the European lexicon. And with it, the aspiration to constitutionally constrain supranational governance. But more importantly, I think the new decade of the millennium heralded the era of the Lisbon Agenda and its successor, Europe 2020. It was a period that seemed to exemplify the gap between high aspirations for joint action in the face of collective challenges, but with the instruments of governance limited to tools like the open method of coordination, often viewed as the archetypal intergovernmentalist method. Even with the advent of economic and monetary union, the centralization of monetary authority was not replicated in the sphere of economic policy, again, where policy coordination was meant to provide policy convergence. Now, building on the systems of economic and uh, employment policy coordinations begun in the 1990s, the, the Lisbon agenda also took on the, the idea that, through, that the way of building a social Europe would again be through methods of, of policy coordination and the kind of things that I was studying uh, when I 
wrote the book on governing social inclusion. Now, for colleagues who have written about the new intergovernmentalism, Maastricht began a process in which member states simultaneously looked to more and more to the European Union as an arena for decision-making, while being unwilling to transfer powers to those EU institutions. Member states seem to will the ends of joint action, but without giving the EU the monopoly of means of achieving its goals. So when we look back on the period since 1992, what do we conclude? Certainly in the wake of the financial crisis, we can see moves to heighten uh, EU-level rulemaking and to intensify the role of European legislation, the six-pack, etc., six-pack, two-pack, etc. And even without the crisis, and we will explore uh, this more uh, in, in a moment, new European agencies dominated key regulatory tasks in areas like medicines and chemicals. But this was not at the expense of an increase in the spheres of intergovernmental cooperation. Reforms to economic governance have also sought to intensify policy coordination through the European semester as a meta-coordination framework. In short, we cannot treat European governance as a kind of zero-sum game in a closed system. As the EU has sought to enhance its governance capacity, it has relied upon different techniques of governance, some supranational, some intergovernmental. So the governance landscape of the European Union is highly variegated, constantly evolving in ways that are not reducible to a simple contest, I think, between intergovernmentalism and, and supranationalism. But to answer the first question I posed at the outset, it's not obvious that Brexit is a response to a heightened supranationalism per se. Now that might seem like a rather odd conclusion when one thread of the taking back control mantra and one that creates a significant red line for the UK in its negotiations with the European Union, is the need to take back control over laws and to end the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice. However, the referendum debate failed to identify, I think, a single law or a single court judgment with which the UK so vehemently opposed as to call into question its European Union membership. So one cannot find specific flashpoints in that way. Indeed, you cannot find the same kind of standoffs you see between Danish Constitutional Court, the German Constitutional Court, the Italian Constitutional Court, and the Court of Justice in the United Kingdom. We simply don't find those examples. But in his Brexit white paper, the UK Prime Minister said this, and it's a, it's a comment you may be familiar with. While Parliament, i.e. the UK Parliament, has remained sovereign throughout its membership of the European Union, it has not always felt like this. Now, one could reasonably conclude that this message just doesn't make any sense. Either you think that sovereignty has been lost, and so you want to regain control, or you can see that sovereignty has not been lost, in which case there is no need to try and seek to take back control. But what I think is apparent is a different recognition. Namely, that it is the totality of European governance, supranational and intergovernmental, and its application across a wide range of policy areas that gives rise to concerns. <coughs> Member states are now deeply embedded in the laws 
and institutions of the European Union and its complex networks of governance that spread out horizontally and link national administrations, a practical example, if you like, of governing through Europe, as well as connecting states vertically into EU decision-making and governing by Europe. The end result of decades of building a governance capacity to address a range of challenges is that the kind of separation between the national and the European that underlies both supranationalist and intergovernmentalist accounts of European integration become very hard to sustain. The European administrations are nationalised in the, in the sense that they rely upon, deeply rely upon the capacities of national administrations and individual national administrators in, their, in bringing their expertise to European agencies. Meanwhile, the national administrations are Europeanized through their influence and exposure both to the European Union and to other administrations of the other member states. So the logic of Brexit is one that tries to restore a separation of the European and the national in order to onshore and repatriate back to the national what was previously European. Or taking the egg out of the omelette, as Pascal Lamy so brilliantly described it. I'll come back to the implications of this more in the third and final part of the lecture. But for the moment, my response to the first question I posed is that it's a mistake to think that we can simply resolve anxieties about being governed by Europe by simply switching between supranational and intergovernmentalist modes of European governance. If the discussion thus far has perhaps had a preoccupation with the experience of EU governance in quantitative terms, then a different sort of lesson might lie in the quality of European governance. If we think back to Moravchik's reinterpretation of European integration in the 1990s, his depiction also had a strong affinity with Nino Maioni's characterization of the EU as a form of regulatory state. And in his book, Governing Europe, Maioni sees EU intervention as a phenomenon driven by the search for credible regulation. For Maioni, the credibility of regulation, more than in its democratic qualities, demanded depoliticization, expert-driven, independent and accountable decision-making. <clears throat> in the context of the single market, credible depoliticized governance by EU institutions, including these new EU agencies, aims to address a range of risks to public health, the environment, and to the proper functioning of the single market through expertise informed by science, accountable ultimately through judicial review. Now this delinking of science and politics is of course not necessarily a particularly easy task. But perhaps the problem is less about delinking science and, and politics and more about where each takes place. A politics remaining stubbornly national, while the tasks of risk regulation and expertise extend beyond borders. Now in areas of controversy like genetically modified food, crops, etc., one can see attempts to renationalize rulemaking and to repoliticize the issues as a matter of national concern. But we do also see, even here, certain cross-national mobilisation around issues um, such as banning uh, neonicotinides, um, 
used uh, as, as a pesticide that affects bees, uh, and also the use of the European Citizens Initiative uh, to repoliticize issues such as banning uh, glyphosate. So politics can be generated, I think, beyond the boundaries of the nation state. But in terms of Brexit, the repatriation of risk regulation in areas of controversy isn't going to make them any less controversial. UK ministers will need to decide whether they want to annoy farmers who want to use pesticides or whether they want to annoy ecologists who want to protect the environment. Now, on the one hand, we might conclude that at least this clarifies where responsibilities lie and enhances accountability, whereas EU networked decision-making obscures who's making decisions about what. On the other hand, if the complaint is a more fundamental one, that politics has been captured by expertise, this may be no different after its repatriation. The UK is now having to enhance its domestic sources of expertise and expand its own domestic re regulatory capacity. And as a small anecdote on that, one area in which the UK will have to develop its own or ha acquire its own expertise is vets, veterinarians, and the work that they do in slaughterhouses. We don't have enough vets who are willing to do that work in the UK. Guess where we've had those vets from? Spain and Portugal, and we want to end free movement. So where is this, reg where is this capacity going to come from? These are some of the capacity issues that, we'll, that the UK is having to face. But in short, onshoring regulation will not be about reducing the regulatory state, but rather cloaking the regulatory state in national clothing. The challenge then will be whether this national version of the regulatory state is both as effective in dealing with transnational risks, while at the same time facilitating legitimate trade in Europe and globally. But perhaps the argument as presented thus far still is too narrow, too narrowly focused on issues around the single market. If we want to get to the heart of the anxiety about what it means to be governed by Europe, we need to look to the extension of the regulatory state into what uh, Genschel and Yachtenfuchs describe as the integration of core state powers. It is in these areas, including fiscal policy, border management, that the EU has experienced intense policy challenges and failures combined with domestic repoliticization. Indeed, Paul Tucker, in his book, Unelected Power, highlights what he sees as the hyper depoliticization of technocracy, the rise of independent institutions like central banks, and a corresponding hyper-politicization manifested in the rise of populism, which is eroding trust in traditional institutions of representative democracy. So we di dislike the transnational technocrats, but we don't even trust our own domestic political representatives. There is then a potential collision course between domestic populist politics and styles and systems of governance that increasingly seek to move decisions out of the realm of political contestation and place them in the hands of technocrats and bureaucrats or even courts. Now, in as much as the EU is an example of the latter or drives tendencies towards the latter, we can see why EU membership comes under strain. <clears throat> when we combine this with policy failures, as in the financial crisis, these strains become even more obvious. <clears throat> 
Now, Brexit is, I think, an interesting context in which to think about all of this. It can be viewed as a populist movement and a backlash against Brussels bureaucrats. Now, insofar as it has roots in post-crisis austerity, the populism is, I think, really more about the austerity than whether Europe was the cause. After all, the UK is a non-Eurozone state, and exposure to the crisis was largely a function of the scale and exposure of the UK banking and financial industries. If anything, the experience tends to highlight the global interdependence of economies and financial markets, raising the question whether the response of Brexit going it alone really makes sense in the face of the types of risks that states now face. However, the bigger Brexit issue in the UK was free movement, which has nothing to do with the power of technocrats, but does have something to do with, the magnitude, with managing the externalities of the political economy of migration in an enlarged European Union that has removed borders. But as a response, Brexit produces its own externalities. And externalities for the rest of the EU over which its citizens have had no say. So when we think about what it means to replace European decision-making, whether it's technocratic or democratic, with national decision-making, again, technocratic or democratic, we are left with the same issue. Namely, that our choices can produce externalities for others. The aspiration of union membership is, has been, I think, to offer a set of institutions and legal structures through which the concerns of out-of-state interests are incorporated into decision-making in managing risks informed by expertise and evidence. That is what it is meant to be both governed by Europe and governed through Europe. Brexit will end up re re replicating the technocratic aspects of the regulatory state, but without any of the means of managing democratically the representation of out-of-state interests, with the likelihood that it simply creates externalities for others. And so to address my second question, yes, there is a rise in populism and it is undermining institutions of representative democracy. And at the same time, there is a trend towards depoliticization that began with the regulatory state and has spread into core state powers. But the relationship between these two trends isn't simply that the latter drives the former. What drives populism in the end is discontent. Discontent with policy failure and anxiety is that governments are not facing up to risks that people really care about and are not doing enough to manage the externalities of risks by others. These are social and environmental risks, economic and financial risks, and concerns about terror and security. These risks go beyond borders, and therefore the challenge of governing by and through Europe lies in its ability to augment and render more effective the capacities of governments to address these risks and reconcile competing interests. So while Brexit may be nodding at a particular kind of problem, it is far from obvious that it's pointing to the right solution. In the final, this final part, though, of the lecture, I want to address what I think will end up being the fundamental of le lesson of Brexit. At its simplest, the question is whether the cessation of EU membership means that a state is simply no longer either governed by Europe or through Europe. 
Membership of the European Union is a voluntary act of sovereign states, as it's, is its decision to end its membership. <clears throat> that was the key message of the full Court of Justice in its Article 50 revocation judgment delivered in December. Now, after Brexit, the UK will join a number of European states who are not EU member states, like Norway, like Switzerland. But these states do have intense relationships with the EU through their respective legal arrangements. The position of the UK to date has been that neither of these arrangements suits the UK. Nonetheless, one way or another, the UK will have a relationship with the EU. And the issue is what sort of relationship and through what legal means. Now, although the UK wishes to remove its egg from the omelette, it still aspires to have access to a range of EU structures, including its agencies. It also wants to cooperate through an ambitious economic and security partnership. So it wants to have, but it also then also wants to have control over free movement and to be at liberty to strike its own trade deals. So the UK, UK wants its own egg, but it still wants some of the omelette. This is also known in the UK as having your cake and eating it. Now, leaving aside the transactionalist view of European cooperation that seems to be driving all of this, the wider lesson that non-EU states uh, find themselves in, sort of, sort of the lesson that we, we learn from, from non-EU states is that they find themselves very exposed to European activities and influences. Compliance with EU norms is a necessity for all businesses operating within the single market. And as Anu Bradford describes, uh, famously described the Brussels effect uh, also means that businesses uh, tend to continue to comply with European norms even in their non-European activities. It simply makes sense to comply with EU rules for all their activities provided they are the highest standard uh, that they need to comply with. As Joanne Scott has, has, uh, has detailed, there is also a wider territorial extension of EU governance, including in areas like EU environmental standards, which apply to activities even that take place outside of the territory of the European Union. So even if the UK did not seek to cooperate with EU institutions, it would find it difficult to escape the influence of the European Union. And given the potential of the EU to exert influence beyond its borders, non-EU states have to consider how to manage that externality and with what consequences for the autonomy of their policy making. Now, what is interesting about the, the EU-UK political declaration is that the EU does seem willing to offer both a broad and deep partnership with the EU that goes beyond existing trade deals without demanding that the EU pre-commit to the sort of alignment with the EU that the EEA agreement with Norway entails. Nonetheless, as we see from the EU's uh, insistence that the UK's financial services submit to an equivalence regime, there are also limits to how flexible the EU will be. Now, the EU's best hope in areas like financial services is in fact that it can try and upload its regulatory preferences to the area of international financial standard setting. All of which usefully reminds us that the EU and non-member states are players in a range of international forums in which regulatory standards are set. But what this highlights is that by exercising exit 
the UK now also has to try and find its voice. And it can try and do that by trying to exert its voice more globally. And this is also part of the kind of global Britain uh, idea uh, in the UK. But the European Union is also a global actor. A global actor that represents 27 sovereign states and their governments and a market of hundreds of millions of citizens and consumers. And therefore, it can also exert its market power. The alternative of competition between the EU and the UK for regulatory influence globally is, of course, cooperation. Even if it rejects being governed by Europe, the UK may yet seek to cooperate through and with Europe. Therefore, my answer to my third question is that either way, the key lesson is that the UK will not be able to avoid Europe. Now, let me conclude briefly by going back to 1992 and the single market programme. Now, one of the ways of persuading governments to remove barriers to trade was through the Cicchini report called The Cost of Non-Europe. Now, it set out to establish a counterfactual of what would confront European states if they opted not to remove barriers to trade. For the EU, Brexit is a kind of counterfactual of the costs of non-Europe. Now, what remains to be seen is whether there are any benefits and whether they compensate for the losses of EU membership. In this way, Brexit is a powerful real-time laboratory for testing whether it is really possible to neither be governed by Europe nor to govern through Europe. It holds lessons for the EU every bit as much as it will for the United Kingdom. But meanwhile, the United Kingdom is currently experiencing the direct costs of non-Europe through the expensive task of hiring civil servants, experts, regulators to undertake tasks currently done by or with EU institutions and other national administrations. That is likely to be a heavy cost, but no one seems to want to put that cost on the side of a bus anytime soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>